Welcome to the EDRM Global Webinar Channel. My name is Mary Mack. I'm the CEO and Chief Legal Technologist for EDRM. Today's webinar is an EDRM collaboration with our trusted partner, Purpose Legal. It's called Nightmare on Review Street, Horror Stories of Managed Review. Our faculty experts are Dove Gold Medina, Bridie Myers, Dr. Maura R. Grossman, and Chris Baker. We welcome your questions and feedback in the console. Questions will be answered at the end of this webinar, and the webinar will be available for uh, replay at your convenience for the next quarter, as are all of our EDRM webinars. Kaylee Walstead, EDRM's Chief Strategy Officer, is here with us today. Can you come on in and please tell us what resources are available, Kaylee? Absolutely. We're really excited about our ON24 platform with so many more exciting ways for you, our audience, to participate and engage. You'll see it in your console, a question mark. This is where you can type in your questions for today's faculty. The slides will be made available after the webinar has concluded. And if you click the paper clip, that's where today's resources are available for you. There is a link to download on 24's engagement tools descriptions to help you better engage. You can click the link to learn more about Purpose Legal Services or schedule a meeting with the experts at Purpose Legal. And up next on EDRM's webinar channel tomorrow, October 31st, leveraging SAS to power mobile data collections and advanced collections. You can save your seat by clicking the link Speaker bios can be clicked and popped up to learn more about today's faculty. And just like Zoom, you'll see the smiley face emoji. There are many more reactions. We highly encourage you to click and engage with them. We're having a lot of fun with them on this platform. You can follow EDRM and Purpose Legal on LinkedIn by clicking the Twitter bird and schedule a meeting with Purpose easily by clicking the book a meeting. And back to you, Mary. Thanks, Kaylee. So for our faculty, we have Chris Baker. He's the Senior Director of Managed Review for Purpose Legal, graduating from Georgetown Law, uh, University Law Center and holding a Bachelor of Arts in Spanish Literature from the University of Texas at Austin. His near two-year journey in the legal realm, he's adept at streamlining, managed review discovery processes, fostering stakeholder relationships, and leveraging strategic insights to drive organizational growth. We also have Bridie Myers, and Bridie is the Discovery Council at Google, an EDRM Global Advisory Council leader, and a key contributor to the GDPR project, formerly with Beringer Ingelheim, our trusted partner, Sidley, McDermott, Will and Emery, and the Cook County Public Guardian. His BA is from the Vir uh, University of Virginia, and JD from William and Mary, and his CIP, he also holds a CIPP uh, slash E. He's a member of the California Bar, the DC Bar, the Illinois Bar, the State Bar of Georgia, and is authorized in house counsel in Connecticut. And Dr. Maura R. Grossman, she's a research professor in the School of Pro Computer Science at the University of Water Waterloo, an adjunct professor at Osgood Hall Law School, an affiliate faculty member at the Vector Institute, all in Ontario, Canada. She's also an e-discovery uh, attorney and consultant in Buffalo, New York, previously of counsel at Wachtell Lipton, where for 17 years she represented Fortune 100 companies and major fi financial institutions in civil litigation and white collar criminal and regulatory investigations. And without further ado, Dove. Hello. Just uh, before I get started, did we recognize Chris? I don't know if we went through Chris's bio. I think we might have skipped that one. Uh, no, we did. We, oh, did. we did? Yeah. Totally missed that. Apologies. Um, then to get our discussion going, I'd like to ask everyone here to share a particularly challenging experience or perhaps a recurrent theme that you run into when managing reviews. Uh, and Maura, can I ask you to get us started? So I will uh, tell you a nightmare. Thank goodness 
it hasn't been a recurrent theme. I, I, it would really be bad if it was a recurrent theme. Uh, so when I was at my former law firm and we had used, we had uh, been doing a managed review with a contract firm and one of my colleagues uh, was supervising that particular review and the colleague and the service provider found one of the reviewers was not performing up to snuff. And I believe they had given some feedback, but I'm not sure the person was alerted sufficiently to understand that they might potentially be terminated from the project. And it was a Friday evening of a long weekend when the my colleague and, and the uh, service provider manager of the project uh, terminated that reviewer telling them that they needn't return on, on Tuesday. Um, that precipitated a bit of a crisis because the terminated reviewer took it upon themselves to email a name partner at the law firm I was at and threaten that person with a lawsuit and other wonderful things like that, which led to an all firm email saying, does anybody know who the heck this person is and uh, what they're talking about? Um, it eventually got settled and taken care of, but I believe it required a fairly substantial severance to make this person go away. They seemed to think they were entitled to be paid for the entire uh, project, but that was a nightmare about how not to deal with reviewers uh, with whom you may be uh, unhappy with their work performance. Yeah, yeah, that, that's always a tough one when you've got a reviewer who uh, is not working out and you need to find the right way to, to convey that. Chris, do you have uh, a nightmare or a current theme you'd like to share? I believe the recurrent themes in, in my experience have boiled down to two different situations. One being the immediate start with a quick turnaround deadline. So by way of example, we had a review that was we were given notice of on the Friday before a three-day weekend that needed to start that Friday afternoon or Saturday morning week. So these types of situations obviously take up uh, a lot of legwork just to get the team and the resources dedicated to the project, but also present challenges insofar as there's often not enough time to get significant amount of feedback from outside counsel or from uh, the end client. And so we are pushing out a work product that uh, hasn't always been both of the potential coding and uh, scope of responsiveness or privilege have been thoroughly vetted out by outside counsel or, or the end client. So having in place the process to account for all of these unknowns is, is essential uh, and having also the resources readily available so you can scale up a team to start on a Saturday morning, work through a holiday weekend uh, and get that done. And that's really where clients respond favorably, you know, really express that their gratification is on the, those nightmare scenarios and being able to get that done uh, more or less seamlessly. And then the second category of nightmare scenarios that we encounter most frequently are just projects that have multi-tiered, multi-level workflows. You know, they're large projects, but also have simultaneously 
different workflows that a single or multiple review manager uh, is trying to, there are no gaps in the review sets that are being looked at or the workflows, and also ensuring that there's no duplicative work. And one of those examples uh, that Purpose Legal handled not too long ago was a project in which we had six different foreign language teams along with an English language team and within each of those redactions, uh, also priv log and also a separate hot doc summary workflow uh, and then implement utilizing analytics and you know, technical solutions along with that and coordinating all that uh, can create those long days, sleepless nights, but circling back to being prepared, uh, having the resources readily available to implement the multi-tiered workflows and document those to ensure that uh, we aren't sk skipping a beat uh, along these multi-tiered examples. Great, thank you. Um, was just trying to check with Bridie. I know Bridie had some trouble connecting. Bridie, are you here with us? Uh, I'm here, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, great. Just wanted to make sure. Um, do you have a nightmare or a current theme that you can share? Yeah, sure. I think, you know, all of us who have been in the space for a while uh, and worked on review projects probably have, have some nightmares. Um, one main one that I was thinking of is a commercial case um, involving a proprietary database. Uh, it was a lawsuit involving one of our competitors. I'm not, I won't name the company, but um, I don't, I don't think, I don't think that matters, but, but the context of, you know, close competition, um, knowing that we were probably going to get challenged in every little thing that we did. Unfortunately, our, this is when I was in in-house counsel, unfortunately, um, one of our uh, outside our outside counsel law firm kind of committed us to producing documents and data from a, a proprietary database that we had. Not very easy to get the, the data out of it. Um, so they committed us to a deadline uh, and then kind of brought in the discovery team to say, you know, make it make it happen. Um, <clears throat> you know, even kind of downloading basic PDF versions was gonna be difficult. In knowing the context that I just kind of outlined for you, I, I anticipated pushback on insufficient metadata, that type of thing. So uh, ended up really kind of having to rush the request, um, push back the deadline, uh, a lot of hand wringing involved there and, and, and stress. And, um, you know, you asked for one example. Another example is just I had another case where similarly we committed to a deadline uh, and then started predictive coding and then brought, um, committed to predictive coding and then brought the discovery team in. Uh, started co predictive coding without any images <laughs> because someone uh, represented that we could do it with just the text, um, which, you know, I, I understand that from a technical side, but uh, we never really actually got the images during the case, during the course of, of the review. So, you know, kind of the overall themes there really are, and we'll talk more about this, I think about understanding individuals' roles and who does what. Um, you know, what does outside counsel do? What does the discovery team do? Uh, what do particular people on the discovery team do uh, are very important. But, but really at the core of that is making sure that all of the players are communicating, that they're coordinating, that you're leveraging um, properly each of your subject matter experts um, for what they're good at. Yes, that's definitely a, a recurrent theme. I mean, another one I've seen, and I think that that touches on that, is what I call being, you know, penny wise and pound foolish, where, you know, you said like loading text only. I mean, that's going to save you on your hosting costs, but it's going to be a problem with review. It's going to slow things down. It's not going to help in the long term. And there's a lot of ways it can manifest. I've seen it where, you know, we need to cut costs. We're going to have a smaller team. Like, we'll have a smaller team. It's going to take longer to get through the docs. There's a lot of ways that trying to cut a corner and save a penny really hurts you uh, in the long run. But let's talk about that, you know, our collective experiences with predominant errors. I mean, I just kind of gave one recurrent theme. Uh, Bridie, you talked about, you know, needing to coordinate and communicate. Uh, can folks share some of the other 
big errors that lead to to those nightmares. Uh, Chris, do you have something you can kick us off with to talk about uh, that predominant error? I think it really, and as has already been alluded to, it is alignment and understanding. It's you know, actually a phrase that Do Dove, you coined on one of our, our team meetings once was not just turned to uh, several times. And it's worthwhile taking a moment to think about the heavy lift that it is to align thinking across a any managed review project, much less a managed review project that presents the numerous, you know, an unexpected number of variables, but we are dealing with the, with outside counsel and any number of partners and associates work the third party vendor, whether the PMs on the hosting side or the managed review team, uh, the end client and their own expectations. And then just within the managed review team, the end goal is to align thinking on literally hundreds of variables with potentially hundreds of thousands of documents across a team of 20, 30, 100 reviewers and to consistently or as consistently as humanly possible uh, assess categorize because that is our gargantuan task so really ensuring that we have an a multi-tiered approach to communications including e calls, team calls that are effective, that have an agenda, that have uh, an end goal in mind, uh, that are then summarized in email and, and shared with all the appropriate stakeholders to ensure that our takeaways from that call and our, our next uh, task and to-do list are understood, the roles and responsibilities are understood, and, and then again, having those follow-up opportunities to realign at each phase or any time that we feel the uh, understanding of expectations or roles or responsibilities uh, are wavering or getting off, off track, having that reconvening and having effective, efficient communications, not meetings for meeting's sake, but uh, purpose, no pun intended, purposefully driven uh, meetings and communications that ensure that folks are aligned, that everyone knows what's going right, what's going potentially could be going better, and our solutions for uh, riding the ship where, where that's necessary. Thank you. Right. Do you want to expand a little bit on the predominant error that you, as I said, alluded to and give us a little bit more on that? Yeah, sure. So, you know, as Chris just talked about, and as I mentioned earlier, I think communication and coordination are really the predominant, the predominant errors, lack thereof, that I see in nightmarish managed reviews. You know, sometimes it is the case that you don't have the right resource. Maybe you don't have the right subject matter expert or you don't have the right technology, um, or you know, maybe you don't have the right right representative from the merits council team who understands enough about DISCO to kind of explain the, the context. But but more often than not, it as as we've been talking about, it's kind of a failure to see the whole field of play in the discovery exercise and really ensure that every player understands context, issues, um, challenges and, and the best way forward. So I think all of that communication is important because, you know, it's the connective tissue that kind of helps everyone get on the same page. Every Everyone has their role to play. Um, they might be thinking of things in a little bit of a different way. And, you know, at least for me, I know as, as usually being the discovery attorney on the team, it, it doesn't always have to be the discovery attorney, right? But there needs to be somebody who kind of is skilled at um, both the discovery process slash tech side 
uh, and understanding the merits enough to to kind of see the full field of, of, of play and help drive that communication and coordination. And if you don't have that, it gets it gets tough pretty fast. Yeah, yeah, it definitely can get tough very quickly. Uh, Maura, care to expand as well on this theme? Sure. So I, I agree with my colleagues that it's that lack of planning, the poor organization, and the lack of clearly defined roles from day one uh, that can cause a project to go off the rails. Uh, more recently, often the provider of the review platform is also the provider of the reviewers. But when I was back at, at my firm, that was not necessarily the case. So you'd have the law firm associate, maybe an e-discovery person, uh, but more often than not, an, uh, an associate who really maybe doesn't know all that much about review and th they, they design a template that has 47 categories on it and uh, then you have the, the review platform provider, then you have the reviewers provider, and then you have a, a client. And if everybody isn't aligned on what the other partners need, it, it really leads to disaster. So an example might be if the review platform provider needs 48 hours to generate TIFF images and to brand them, and the law firm is expecting to get the production out and Friday at four o'clock, and none of this has been communicated, you know, you're asking for a late production because everybody on the team doesn't know that it takes 48 hours you know, to brand. And um, so that's when I've seen the disasters are these lack of coordination, lack of planning. There isn't one person in charge where the buck stops here who, who makes the final decision. People aren't giving feedback. So the, the review provi provider of the reviewers sees the problem with the 48 coding categories, but maybe doesn't speak up or maybe only tells the client, but doesn't tell the rest of the team. And in these circumstances, sometimes these different players can have different relationships with the client or maybe no relationship with the client because it may be the law firm that has, fought, that has hired one or more of these players and then you can get finger pointing and backstabbing and all kinds of other problems that arise because of this octopus has all the arms going in the different direction, not coordinated. And so you really do need that, that very much upfront discussion planning. People need to feel they're on one team that has maybe four arms, not four teams uh, and that that the, the goal is perfect to go smoothly, not for them to look the best in front of the client. Um, so sometimes it's a pain in the butt to have these 9 a.m. calls every day, uh, but they may very well be necessary so that on Monday somebody can learn that it takes 48 hours for the provider to, to do the tipping and the branding and stuff and and people can can plan accordingly so it, it really is those project management skills and and bringing together diverse groups so that they all feel invested and feel like they're part of of one project yeah i'd like to go into that a little bit further let's talk about some of the the best practices so that we can avoid the nightmare situations you know, you talked about having an upfront call, uh, a pre-kickoff call, it's often referred to, where you can plan out and design for the review so that everyone knows what their roles are. Uh, and maybe before even review gets started, before that first doc gets coded, we know it's 48 hours to turn that production around. And by planning out, you know, what the timelines are going to look like, who's responsible for what piece, and when 
those pieces are going to fall into place, you avoid a nightmare. So uh, what are those best practices? Uh, Chris, care to get us started on some best practices? Well, having best practices is the number one best practices. Having process processes in place uh, as everyone on this presenting, we know the number of things that can go sideways uh, on any given project. And you know, we talk about what is a nightmare project. To me, a nightmare project is any project that's keeping me up at night. And frankly, those are a lot of projects because the more complex they are, the more things can go wrong, the more uh, variables and unknowns there are. So having as a starting point, your processes in place that have been vetted out that are best practices for any number of scenarios, when not just our standard privilege responsiveness review, but all of the nuances for projects where we have 20, 30 issue codes, uh, projects that we have uh, more nuanced approaches to confidentiality, projects where we are dealing with uh, massive amounts of redactions, and whether they be PII or privilege redactions or PHI redactions. So having processes in place that are still flexible and malleable uh, for changing scenarios, but having a starting point. And then beyond that, with process comes the next step for me is the people, knowing your team, knowing your team's strengths, areas in which they might need growth. So we know how to build up our team. It is not just throwing bodies at a project, but rather it is a bespoke approach to staffing a review team so that they have strengths that complement each other, that we ensure that they are going to work cohesively and in something as simple as ensuring that there's coverage, that we have folks both on the East Coast and the West Coast so that we have coverage throughout uh, the day on a project. And then you know, the third P I would say is planning. Uh, we have our process in place. We know our team, we know our people. Make sure that we are planning for any number of variables, uh, any number of things that, again, in our, in our experience can go a certain way. Plotting those, uh, the potential outcomes for each solution and communicating that with all stakeholders. A plan in place, a tried and true process, and a team or people that can carry that out to a, a solid finish. Maura, do you want to expand on some of the best practices you talked about? I know you mentioned, you know, a morning call, some other good ones you think everyone should live by? Yeah, de definitely the regular touch points. Uh, know up front what your reporting is going to be and have a standard report that comes around at the end of every day or first thing in the morning that, that shows the progress that's got any deadlines that are coming up, just all that nice project management stuff. I think you need to have a way to surface problems, especially when you've got multiple groups working together. So sometimes somebody notices something and they don't know who to bring it to or they don't want to, you know, buck the tide or they don't want to criticize another entity or, or whatever. And so somebody sees something but doesn't say something. Uh, well enough in advance. So you have to have a way of surfacing problems in 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 a way that's comfortable that people feel they can uh, they can flag things you know long before the train goes off the track. And and in part that also include, includes having clear lines of authority. You can't have a situation where there's no decision maker. You know there's no head. At, at the t at the top of the of the body, 
somebody needs to be the the point person and um so that these problems can come to to this person and, and when they're materialized i also think you have to have i mean i don't sit down and have a million contingency plans but you have to know how you're going to um you're going to have to uh, know how you're going to deal with unanticipated contingencies. They happen all the time, whether it's you notice all of a sudden there are documents that have links, except you, the links don't go anywhere because nobody's collected those. Um, you know, do you just keep your mouth shut or do you actually go back to the, the, the client to raise it with, um, you know, do you raise it with the the team because otherwise the documents get produced and then the other side starts saying um all of a sudden you know where are all, all the attachments or the modern attachments and things like that so you have to have plans because on every matter there are unknowns that that happen um but but basically i i think it's ultimately getting people to be comfortable speaking up if if the budget is going to be overrun or deadlines aren't going to be met rather than keeping it to themselves and praying you know to to speak up early enough that that people can actually do something about it yeah yeah that's part of communication is raising when when something is not going well uh Bridie, care to help us as well give us some of those best practices yeah, I, I completely agree with what Moore just said. I think it's so important really to feel like all of the core team members or at least representatives of kind of each of the sub teams are, are part of a, a core team that comes together and feels that they're empowered to speak up. Um, that's that's extremely important. So, you know, I agree with everything that both Chris and, and Moore said. I, I personally like playbooks, even though I know they seem a little bit outdated <laughs> a lot of people don't want to use them, but, but I do agree that documentation in terms of best practices, if not a full big playbook, is, is important um, so people have the information in front of them to reference and you can say that you provided it to them. I think, you know, uh, more kind of touched on reporting, I think documentation is extremely important. Um, you know, what are those things that you care about that you need transparency on? Um, decision making, especially, I think, needs to be documented so everybody can reference it. Um, having, you know, as, as Chris kind of pointed out, just, you know, digging into these things is, and doing them is, is really kind of the answer. Having a regular communication cadence uh, is, is extremely important. Um, you know, one of the things that I used to do is, um, and, and I did this when I was, um, you know, in-house counsel, is I let, our, I let our discovery meetings for a given matter. Um, and, you know, we would have outside counsel on them. We would have our in-house uh, lead merits counsel on them. We would have our paralegals. I would bring in actually our IT people um, at the time. That was our legal tech resource. Uh, any project managers. Um, it's a lot of people, right? This was only like, you know, maybe once a week. But we literally used the EDRM to organize our discussion. Start the discussion with, okay, outside counsel, you know, from, from your perspective, you know, what are our scheduling deadlines for discovery? What are the things that we need to get to first? What are our responses to the RFPs going to be, right? Can you give us context around that? Um, and, you know, obviously we're focused on review here, but I think if you have that type of organization, people get used to it and they start thinking in terms of, you don't always have to think in terms of EDR and phases, right? But they start thinking in, in terms of, okay, well, you know, I need to be prepared to report on this aspect of things. And that kind of helps promote the empowerment that, that Moore touched on that I think is, is so important. Um, that's just one of the things I do. And by the time you get to review, um, you know, the, the we've already established relationships where the outside counsel trusts our tech team. And, you know, the tech team has kind of highlighted things uh, in advance that we all need to think about and plan ahead for that type of thing. Yeah, I definitely have seen projects where, where things just get siloed. And you know, when you're in those silos, you're not raising the, the the problems that have arisen. You know, you're not flagging it for the broader team. But by having the broader team communicate early on, as you said, you build that trust. It makes it very comfortable for everyone to raise problems and avoid the nightmare. Um, but now that we've talked about avoiding the nightmare, what do we do when we're in the nightmare? When things start to go off the rails, how do you get them back on the rails? How do you recover from that? Maura, 
ways that we have to recover when we're going going down a dark path. You called on me? Okay. Yes. Um, I, you have to get people into problem solving mode rather than finger pointing mode. Uh, it's all of us, all of us naturally fall into finger pointing mode in that circumstance, especially when it's there are three or four groups and, and you don't have control over all of them. But the most productive place to be is to say, okay, let's stop and figure out what is the most efficient and effective way to get us out of this, the, you know, the get the wheel out of the mud, uh, so to speak. And, um, Sometimes that's a difficult conversation to have. To, you know, you you bite your lip, but maybe later on you'll blame somebody uh, for for not communicating or for for really screwing something up a deadline. But re really, it's getting into that problem solving mode. You want to alert the client fairly soon, even though your your instinct is, well, we'll probably get out of this, so we maybe we won't alert the client, but you are better off alerting the client because it's really bad when you have to tell them we're not going to have the production on time or, or we produced all the privileged documents instead of the non-privileged ones accidentally, you know, or, or something like that. Um, and and the, ideally, you say, here's the problem and here's the solution. So here's what we screwed up, um, but here's the plan. So we're not going to have it at Friday at four, but we will have it Friday at ten, and and we've already called the other side, and everybody's okay with that, and and whatever. So uh, it's good to have the solution to present, and and that, I always say that to team members too, that that it, it's all good, uh, well and good to go and present a problem, but people love you even better if you can present the solution with the problem. Yeah, yeah, presenting both under the client, it, it makes makes you look good. It makes it look like you're on top of it. Even when something has gone wrong, you're on top of it, you're fixing it. Um, Chris, care to uh, expand on that as well, how we can fix it, how we can present those solutions? Agree 100% with the uh, points that Maura make made it is a culture of accountability, which will lead to identifying that problem early on, really being able to articulate what went wrong when you present it to the client. Uh, again, hopefully early on in that process, it is being able to avoid the vagaries of or the finger pointing, but drill down to what went wrong uh, because everyone's holding themselves accountable. And then yep, to expand on, Mato said, presenting the solution is key. Uh, and ideally presenting more than one solution. Uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat. There's always more than one solution to uh, a managed review process gone wrong. So presenting multiple solutions with sufficient detail, again, avoiding the vagaries of what the process is going to look like and boiling it down to counsel or outside counsel or the client in cost, both in terms of time, resource and dollars and cents. So that when they're looking at potential solutions, they're not only evaluating the effectiveness of the solution, but also what that is going to represent in those costs and, and output and, and the delivery in terms of what their final invoice might, how their final invoice might be affected so they can make a fully informed decision on the best way forward. And, and again, as you said, Dove, it shows that we are thinking about these things proactively, not just this, this went wrong, maybe we're to blame, maybe someone else is to blame, but rather it is a objective view of the project, but also forward thinking as to what is the best path forward. Yeah, being proactive. And, and as you said, you know, 
addressing the the elephant in the room, the invoice, because that's very often what the client cares about a lot. Um, and, and discussing that with them is going to going to help with any fears they have at ease and get past the nightmare. Friday, anything to add on how we can work through the nightmares? Yeah, I mean, once again, I, I agree with with both my colleagues. I think you know, hopefully, if you fostered uh, the the culture of inclusion, then people can feel empowered to speak up and less afraid when you know maybe the the issue that they're they're spotting is kind of coming from their area of responsibility, right? Um, I always looked at it, especially once I was in house as you know as a client. Um, look, I have a huge opportunity to kind of set the tone and take. Um, you know, take, you know, Chris talked about uh, cultural accountability, take accountability for when things go wrong and really kind of just recognize that, look, it's e-discovery, things are probably going to go wrong. You know, even on really good, really good reviews where there aren't crazy nightmares and you meet your production deadlines, um, you know, there's still stuff that goes wrong all the time. It's just kind of the nature of what we do. So I think you need to, you know, not let people feel like, yeah, it's okay if you kind of screw around and make mistakes and don't care, but, you know, realize that, you know, this isn't about perfection. I mean, even even rules of civil procedure talk about talk about not having to be perfect, right? And so, when something really goes wrong, it's just same thing that we've already been, we've been talking about. Bring everyone back together, talk through the issues with the entire team. You know, also give people a chance to kind of manage their aspects of the issue. They might have, um, you know, we talked about coming prepared with potential uh, solutions. I think that's a really good idea. Um, but, you know, I think so, so many of these problems are exacerbated because people are not sharing the information they have or the suggestions that they have or they don't feel empowered to. But you really need to because there might be something that someone else uh, in their role, um, you know, maybe they're not responsible for what caused the issue exactly, but we're all part of the team. They might have a solution that doesn't actually involve, you know, the exact solving the exact problem and what i mean is let's say there's a technical solution and you know we're just we can't get this thing fixed and we're not going to be able to meet the production deadline because there's a problem in the review database or something well you know give outside counsel a chance to advocate for pushing the date back or to clarify you know what really matters in terms of going out the door that's what the thing um just trust that everyone is gonna be able to work on it together and kind of problem solve it together I, I think that's the only thing that you can do. Dov, can I add one more point? Um, for the providers who are on the call, it can go a long, long way to client relationships um, when, number one, a genuine apology, and number two, doing something about it, like giving the client, a reimbursing them for something that they shouldn't have had to pay for or giving them a credit uh, or some kind of discount. I know that I always uh, appreciated that when I was a, a client, when somebody took responsibility for, for a screw up and, and made it right in some way, that made me far more likely to forgive the error and to hire them again than if they insisted on charging me every single cent they were entitled to, even though they were responsible, you know, for some screw up. So I think that that uh, don't be penny wise and pound foolish by charging the max on this matter, but you may never get another one again because you pissed somebody off. You can get some goodwill by saying, uh, we really botched this. It, it shouldn't have been late. Sorry about that. We're not going to charge you for the overtime that it cost or whatever it is. Yeah. I mean, Chris talked about incorporating the discussion of the invoice with part of the solution. And that can be, uh, this is what's going in dollars and cents, and this is what we're not billing you for. Um, that can, as you said, garner a lot of goodwill. Um, and, and I also wanted to kind of build on something that was brought up, which is when the finger point pointing starts when the blame game starts, how can you kind of stop that? Because I don't think the blame game, I think everyone would agree here, that the blame game is not going to be helpful. It's not going to help solve it. So what can you do to move past the blame game? Um, and and, and Bridie, what can you uh, share to help us move past the blame game? Yeah, I think it's, it's you know, um, it's a little bit, I mean, more of the same. I think really kind of what Maura just said, being very transparent and, you know, kind of 
you know, taking on the blame if it came, I guess, from your direction, um, you know, is one of the best things that you can do to kind of just hop on the grenade and, and blunt, blunt the process um, of, of finger pointing. You know, I, and, and if you're not the one who kind of made a mistake or it's not coming from your area of responsibility, I, just putting out there when you do all come together and talk, uh, making it clear that what you care about is just, you know, how can we course correct? Again, I mentioned earlier from the client perspective, um, I, I tried to set the tone for that. It's just, you know, it's from a client perspective, it's kind of finger pointing. It's kind of a waste of time. You know, I know that it happens and none of us are perfect, but, um, you know, I think just someone, hopefully whoever that leader is of the group, uh, needs to set in, step up and, and set the tone and really make it a safe place to kind of, again, as Maura said, focus on problem solving, focus on how can we get through this instead of, you know, who's at fault. Um, ultimately, it, it, you know, who's at fault doesn't, doesn't really matter anyway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, as I said, I mean, I think part of the issue is getting past it so you can fix it. Pointing the blame is not fixing it. I mean, root cause analysis and figuring out what went wrong can help prevent it the next time. Um, but fixing it this time, in my experience, is more important than than pointing fingers. Chris, care to build on that? The only thing I, I'd add is the example is set from top down. Uh, so as a department head, you know, we department head should be setting that example early on in other instances where we have uh, things that have gone awry. What could I have done to implement a process, provide the appropriate resource, or as we've discussed previously, create a, an environment where there isn't an, that element of fear that I can't, I got to fix this myself. Otherwise, uh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose my job, but rather having a collaborative environment. And so again, top down culture that's again, buck stops with me. I, there's always something I could have done differently. Uh, to have prevented something going wrong within the department, and hopeful, and that I think permeates throughout the department. So each individual is reflecting constantly on, on what could I have done uh, differently, uh, slightly better, and then as you, everyone's noted, sometimes it's just a matter of like we're going to put a pin in this, we're going to. Re re revisit, we'll dig into it and have, again, a collaborative uh, discussion on what we all could have done differently. But for now, we are solution focused. We have to go move forward and get this taken care of. Uh, and then the only other thing I'd add is, you know, in the same way as we want to explore what goes wrong and make sure that that's communicated both to client and to our team where things go right. You know, that's often time, and I know this is about nightmares and not uh, great, great dreams that we have, but when things go right, we also want to develop that same habit of assessing what did we do the same Differently in these instances, uh, how can we translate that to a client? And again, in terms of dollars and cents and time that was saved, we are we are creating better workflows, anticipating potential problems, and the client isn't only aware of where we are, we could have done better, but also where we did do better and what that means to them. Yeah, and definitely communicating that it, it helps when the nightmares do occur because if the client sees you know four great projects and one nightmare project they know that more of the projects than not are going really really well um mora any all, anything to add and i'll also you know if there isn't a lot to add um as we get closer to wrapping up um just want to see if anyone has you know key insights so more if you want to add and then maybe transition to talking about key insights key recommendations lessons takeaways from the many, many nightmares that are out there. Sure. So I, I agree with everything my colleague said, and I don't think I could have uh, put it better. Two things to add. I, I agree with the tone from the top. So 
you can't afford to lose your cool. You you just can't. You can't raise your voice um, because if if you lose it and lose your calm, it it just trickles down. So no matter how upsetting and and whatever, you have to just put a pin in it. Um, the other thing that I think can be helpful uh, sometimes is the postmortem, the get together after the matter is done and uh, reviewing what went well and what didn't go well. So for next time, uh, we have that information. Um, I think the biggest takeaway for people on, on this call uh, might be um, if you don't, if you haven't read anything on project management, or if you've never taken a project management seminar or course or something like that, uh, that might be really, really helpful, for, especially for those of you who manage reviews with any uh, frequency to get into that systematic project review mindset where you have a budget, you have a goal, you have very clear route to the goal you have you are very clear lines of authority all all these things are straight project management sort of ideas i don't i don't think we've said anything today that that you know requires a major phd or anything like that but implementing these uh in a, in a systematic organized planful way is really what helps rather than just making assumptions uh, about what other people are going to do or who knows what uh, and and all of that. That's what it really leads to disaster. Yeah, yeah. The old adage, failing to plan is planning to fail. Yeah, um, but right. as you said also, you know, getting the education. A lot of folks look at uh, certifications in the technology, but just the project management, you know, it, it's something as simple as a project management course is going to help you. Uh, in the long run. Bridie, what, what are your key takeaways, your key lessons to avoid nightmares? Sure. It's, you know, it's not about the difficulty of the managed review challenge itself, or the particular deadline, the volume of documents, you know, or even challenges around which workflow or disagreements around which workflow you're going to use or which, you know, awesome legal technology is being utilized. It really is, as we've been talking about, about proactive coordination and communication if you want to avoid nightmares. I think that people process technology. We talk about that a lot in discovery. There are good ways to think about it, but there needs to be really kind of an organizing voice that understands enough about the merits of the case and the discovery challenges to drive the group in the right direction. And, you know, we've talked about roles and responsibilities, about people feeling empowered, whatever your role or responsibility is. I wouldn't suggest that people start taking on the jobs of other, other, you know, of others on the team. But I do think the most valuable uh, members of any managed review team are the ones who are able to kind of understand the different perspectives. And I think that's true in a lot of different things, whether it's business or, or law, when you're kind of working in an organization or with a team that is, you know, made up of multiple different. Uh, organizations or representatives from different organizations. You know, the more that you can see the other person's perspective and invest a little bit of time and energy, um, the better it'll be. I think e-discovery, especially document review, can really feel like a slog to some folks. And it can feel like, especially if you're on the team that's doing the document review, that, you know, you're, you're just putting in a lot of uh, sweat equity and under a lot of pressure. and and just, you know, really kind of trying to push through things. But I do think, you know, for those document reviewers who are attorneys, you know, don't forget that you're attorneys. Um, you know, you can read the rules of civil procedure. You, you're reading the complaint. Um, you know, maybe there are others on the team who are asking those big questions and deciding the strategy, and that's their role. But don't stop thinking about it. I mean, this can be fun. It doesn't really have to be so laborious all the time. And I think that's true from whatever perspective you're in, if you're, you know, the person who's kind of on the technical side of things, you know, I'm not saying go out and, you know, take a, a law school class, but I do think the more that you can understand the perspective of the lawyers, you know, the more things will make sense to you and the more you'll realize that how valuable your role is in that context. So, um, 
you know, maybe that's a lot of kumbaya stuff, but I think at the root of it, it's, um, you know, don't just see your job in the process for being limited to just your job. Um, the fact is every single person who's on a managed review team is important. And um, you can you can really help uh, drive a better mm-hmm. review if, if you're opening up to other people's uh, perspectives. Bridie's a hundred percent right on that. The best way, and this is for the reviewers who may be listening in. The one of the best ways to get yourself hired as a staff attorney from being a contract attorney is being seen as that really high quality reviewer who anticipates things, problems before they arise, and points them out or notices, you know, that four people during the day had a conversation about a particular kind of document and, and really don't have a, a meeting of the minds on on what whether it's relevant or not and being that sort of point person who um, brings extra value. Um, people at law firms really notice that. Yeah, yeah, being proactive is, is definitely a, a good way to shine in everyone's eyes. Chris, your key lessons and takeaways for us? Yeah, I'm just going to reiterate what my colleagues have already said because I do think it's such a important element. Uh, so often managed review is thought of just this rote process, process like Rody said, you know, slog that is to be, you know, just bide your time. But the reality is it is, can be very complex, very nuanced and requires the investment of the entire team. So investing all stakeholders, both within your organization and out in this process and providing them the feedback, again, not only when things go wrong, but when things go right, that uh, will inure to more investment in a project and something that uh, on our teams we really stress with our review managers is having our contract attorneys that are reviewing at a first level or at a QC level actively participating in calls and whether that just means you need we need to have them prepare beforehand and let them know we'd like them to speak up on this call uh, regarding what they've been seeing in the workspace, uh, the challenges that they've been confronted but again, finding any opportunity to invest from, again, our contract attorneys to our team leads, review managers, department heads, everyone invest in a project. So it, is, it does become a proactive environment that's going to lead to a more fulfilling workspace, uh, a more fulfilling work environment, but also just a much higher quality work product. Um, I just was checking to see if we had uh, any questions. Um, there was a request as we kind of, um, just to see if anyone had good project management classes since we did recommend. I don't know if anyone has any on, on that. There is a PMP certification that people can get and I know Michael Quartararo has a book on project uh, management that you can get and read, particularly it's specific to project management and e-discovery. All right. Well, we can maybe uh, do some research to follow up on that, but I do think we are uh, out of time. Mary, I see you've joined, rejoined. Absolutely. And thank you, Dove. You have moderated exquisitely. And we thank you and our trusted partner, Purpose Legal, uh, for making your colleague Chris Baker, Bridie Myers, and Dr. Mora R. Grossman available for this educational provocative session. Our thanks to the EDRM community for your kind attention, and we'll see you next time on the EDRM Global Webinar channel. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care. Thank you.